We're here on the well-worn and foot-beaten trail of the Arbel Pass. This path was undoubtedly a place where Jesus and his disciples would have walked in their travels. It is a road of pilgrimage that leads from Nazareth, which is the village where Jesus grew up, to the Sea of Galilee, which is the area where Jesus did most of his earthly ministry. It was possibly during one of these journeys that the disciples would ask Jesus to teach them to pray. In Luke 11, 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. This is a very common question from new believers. How should we pray? And what should we pray for? Jesus answers his disciples here in Luke 11 with nearly the same exact prayer he teaches about in Matthew chapter 6 during what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. This prayer has been deemed by many as the Lord's Prayer, but I think it more rightfully could be called the model prayer because it was the prayer that Christ gave his disciples as a pattern. Before he gives them this model prayer, Jesus gives them some warnings to beware of as they pray. In Matthew 6, 5 through 8, it says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Jesus warns His disciples not to pray in front of others, to be perceived as spiritual. He says only hypocrites do this. He tells them to pray to God in secret so that their intentions will be proved genuine. Jesus also wants them to know that God desires genuine prayers, not wordy prayers. He tells them that God doesn't answer prayers because they are complicated or high-minded. God answers the genuine prayers of His children because He loves them. We don't have to put on a show for God. That doesn't mean we should be irreverent or flippant. But it does mean that we can approach God with the reality of our life, right where we are. Jesus then proceeds to teach them a model or a pattern for all of their prayers. Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In prayer, as well as in all things, we should start by addressing God as our Father. This is what Jesus did, and it's a reminder of who we are praying to. We are speaking to God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, the God who is above all, the mighty and eternal God, the God who not only pardoned us from the consequence of our sin, by what Jesus did on the cross, but also grafted us into the eternal family of God by which we are able to call God our Father. This is a wondrous and amazing thought. Then we acknowledge that the name of the Lord is holy and to be hallowed and reverenced. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And once we acknowledge who God is and who we are to him, we make our prayer request in light of two things. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Praying this way narrows the scope of what we should want and really as Christians, what we're living for. We pray all things in light of God's kingdom coming and His sovereign and perfect will. Asking that our requests mirror in this fallen and twisted world 
the perfection and beauty of heaven. So, in light of God's coming kingdom and God's perfect will, we make our requests in prayer. God, give us this, our daily bread. We ask God to meet our needs, to take care of our family, so that we can have food and clothes and all the things we need here on the earth. Then he says, forgive us of our debts, that we also might forgive our debtors. We ask God to forgive our sins. And in light of his forgiveness towards us, we forgive all who have wronged us. Jesus even goes on to say in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive others of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How could we ever hold a sin against someone who has wronged us in light of the lifetime of sin that God has forgiven us for? If we are unwilling to forgive others, it shows that we do not really perceive the magnitude of our need for God's forgiveness in our own life. And finally, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is the blessed hope we have in the gospel. As we pray for God to lead us in paths of righteousness and ultimately to deliver us from evil. When we pray, we approach God as Father, knowing that He hears us. We reverence His name and remind ourselves that He is holy and above all else. We make our request in light of God's kingdom, not ours, and God's will, not our own. And through this lens, we make our request for the things we need. We make sure our heart is right with God and with others, and we look towards eternity, where ultimately and permanently God will deliver us from this fallen and evil world.